Hello everyone, Hyper here. And with progress being over and my guild getting the rank of US 7th, I thought it's a good time to make a video about this new raid and what I think about each boss and my general impressions about the raid itself. First of all, we have champions. And this might be one of the most underwhelming first bosses ever to be created. The only boss easier than this is probably Champion's Heroic. And I think they went the wrong way about creating this boss. As a first boss, it is usually important to have it um, be pretty easy since, you know, you want heroic raiders to move up to mythic and for them to kind of have an introduction into the mythic scene. But the boss should be easy to do when done correctly and very difficult to do if you mess up mechanics. If you think of bosses like the first boss in Tomb of Sargeras or Antorus, both of those bosses were fairly difficult to do if you messed up mechanics, but as long as you did the mechanics correctly, the boss was fairly straightforward. This boss is the complete opposite. The whole point of the boss is to ignore every single mechanic and just kill the boss as fast as possible. And I'm very surprised this is, that it hasn't been hotfixed since week 1 and you're still able to stack your entire raid in melee. The biggest downfall of this boss, in my opinion, is that it should have had about 30 to 50% more HP because it lacks mechanics. So since you don't have mechanics to do, all you do is turret the boss the entire time. So either the mechanics should have been more impactful or the boss should have had more HP. Because seeing sub 2 minute kills week 1 was pretty surprising, I'm not gonna lie. Going on to the second boss for Horde, which is Grong. And this is a pretty cool fight design, but I think it was placed in the wrong order in the raid because the DPS check on this boss just ends up being irrelevant. And this was kind of mentioned in my guild as well. Having the DPS check boss be the second in the raid is kind of a mistake because you will always make the check as long as you're a higher end mythic guild and you have the gear for it. The other part of this boss, controlled heavy AoE like you have on this boss where you know predictably when you're going to be taking heavy amounts of damage is probably the best type for healers because you can simply rotate healer cooldowns. And also week one, the whole thing where Gronk picks up the tank and tosses him away was completely mitigated by having double prop paladin and just running bops. From a DPS perspective, this is a pretty straightforward fight. Um, however, I think the fear mechanic and the melee AoE should have been a little more prevalent. If the fear always came out when he had to move to an add, then that would have made movement a little bit more difficult. And then if the melee mechanic, where it, it pounds a melee and does the AoE damage on the entire melee group, would have done more damage, that would have forced you to set up maybe a few melee camps rather than just have all your melee stacked and then ignore two mechanics. That could have also made the fight a little more interesting. Moving on to Jade Fire Masters, this was probably one of my favorite earlier bosses because there are so many mechanics on it. I didn't actually proc this fight, but I found that having immunities or certain immunities be able to immune the traps while others you still got knocked up with was a questionable decision because you already took one class that is very strong, which is rogues, and kind of forced you to stack as many of them as possible. Well, in reality, you only needed like two or three, but that would essentially eliminate an entire mechanic from the fight. And then the intermission phases were interesting. The, my only complaint on this fight is that there's no punishment for having one boss basically dead as you're going into the last phase and then just having to deal with one boss. If there was some sort of mechanic that forced you to keep maybe a 5 to 10% HP range between the two bosses, that would have made the last phase a lot more interesting and it actually feel like you had an execute phase. Moving on to opulence. Another pretty interesting fight as far as design goes and the only issue with this is that phase 1 is the only hard part of the fight. As long as you make it to P2 with everyone alive you're almost guaranteed to kill the boss as long as you're running a few paladins to, to bob the coin shower. Now there were a few things in this fight, uh, in, especially in P2 that I think could have been a little different like forcing the coin shower to do the split damage so not being able to bop it. Uh, because if you are sacrificing DPS from the start, then you're going to be falling behind on the boss. But since you're just able to bop every single coin shower or just sacrifice them and b them, 
you keep that damage and you prevent a very large amount of damage from going onto the raid. In phase 2 I think the boss either had too little HP or maybe the buffs were a little too strong, so either of those getting slightly tuned, maybe tweaked a little bit, uh, would have made this fight a lot more interesting. Moving on to Conclave, this was the first fight where you really felt like playing melee is an absolute waste of time because you're running around killing raptors and running around from mechanics half the time and you just lose so much boss up time that it's actually crazy. So this fight again I did as Frost which looking back at it was a mistake I should have definitely played Unholy on this fight but at the time I just didn't have the gear for it. So this fight is interesting in as much as you have the choice between what the boss order is that you want to do, how you want to deal with the mechanics, but you were basically forced into a specific boss order because of some significant overlaps. So if you ever got the overlap where you got the Kimball Pounce, the Kimball's Wrath, I think it's called, um, while you had to stand in Paku's circle, that would basically wipe your raid. So the entire strategy on this fight revolves around avoiding those bad overlaps. And I think we're just now getting to the point where we can lust on pull and nuke down the first boss quickly enough to avoid that overlap. But for a few weeks, you basically had to hold your cooldowns in phase one, then kill the boss fairly quickly in phase two, and then you would just lust for the sake of lusting in, at some point in the fight, but it didn't actually make a difference. Moving on to King Rastakhan, um, another fight I did in Prague, but with the strategy where you send all your ranged DPS downstairs, that made this fight significantly easier. Turning a phase that was heavily dominated by melee in the way I think it was intended to be dealt with into a phase that is just dominated by ranged uh, changed this fight up a lot. The rest of the fight is just personal responsibility. Uh, you just run around, drop portals, you know, avoid mechanics. And also having the mind control being uh, tremorable by shamans was a pretty interesting to me because it essentially removed the mechanic entirely from the group as long as you had two shamans. Uh, because you never got a second mind control as, your, as long as your DPS swapped to it. It was pretty interesting to see that a mechanic could be negated that heavily by a single class. I also think it's pretty weird that the flame totem from phase one doesn't happen any at any point uh, throughout the rest of the fight because that would actually put some sort of space restriction on everyone. Um, but phase one is so short that that totem is basically irrelevant to the entire fight. And also in the last phase, fights that are at this point in the raid, so this is what the fifth boss, actually the sixth boss, they should have some sort of ramping damage when you're going into the last phase. And the soft enrage can either come, like I said, from ramping damage or from some sort of space management point of view where you run out of space, um, so you have to kill the boss in, an, in a limited amount of time. But on this boss, it just wasn't significant enough, and the damage check um, or the, the space management from having a lot of portals was just not significant enough to impact the phase in any major way. Moving on to Mechatork, I think this was the first decently tuned fight, and this was actually an interesting fight and one that I like quite a bit. It's all personal responsibility with like a little bit of, of raid management, but the mechanic where you need to call out each other's colors, I think is very cool. I am however surprised that they included this in Heroic as well, where a lot of pugs don't use comms, and if you don't use comms, just having to type out each other's colors is absolute insanity to me. But overall this fight was good, the damage ramp was felt significant in the last phase, uh, there were definitely some overlaps that are both avoidable damage and unavoidable damage that you needed healing cooldowns for, and you kind of had to keep the fight going by executing everything properly. And then you also hit a point in the fight where you just have so many puddles behind the rocks with the line of sight that you might have to sacrifice players just so they don't zap the raid. So this fight overall had a lot of intricacies, which I found interesting. The only thing, again, uh, having a boss that relies on having one or preferably two death knights and then two druids 
um, is okay for most mythic guilds that are at the higher end, but maybe for lower end mythic guilds who maybe don't have death knights at all or don't have druids at all, that fight becomes significantly more challenging if you don't have those classes. Moving on to Stormwall Blockade, I think this was the only fight that was actually tuned properly. Too bad that they didn't finish the bug fixes until like week 3 of the raid. So in its current state, I think it's a very good second to last boss. But this fight was changed 3 or maybe 4 times um, before it reaches current state. So the first week of this fight, you were able to use your pets to soak the ires in phase 2. In phase 1, you were able to just lust and nuke down the bosses, or even not lust, we didn't lust and we still made the damage check. Uh, so you never interrupted the bosses in phase 1. And then in phase 2, again, you were able to position on the edges of the platform to avoid the lasers, and you were able to drop the add on a pillar, and it would just teleport to the back. So the first hotfix was the pet thing. Uh, you are no longer able to soak the ires with pets, but you still did phase 1 and phase 2 the same, uh, except for the, the pet soak thing. After that, they hotfixed that you are no longer able to drop the adds on a pillar, uh, so they wouldn't teleport to the back of the room anymore. Then they hotfixed the boats. Uh, it kind of forced you to interrupt their first cast, but then you still did the rest of the fight the same way. After that, they hotfixed the boat again, causing the bosses to teleport um, whenever they reach 50%, no matter what. And in the same hotfix, they also changed phase 2 to make the lightning basically unavoidable except for melee. So that was very frustrating because once you kill this boss, you're on Jaina. And you want to get as much time on Jaina as humanly possible because it's a large pull count for this boss. And having a boss be changed on you every single time you kill it is very frustrating because it's, it changes up the strategy and you have to spend an extra 10-20 pulls uh, basically reprogressing the fight with a new strategy every single week. So that was very annoying to do. But if the boss was released like it is in the raid today, I think this would have been a great second to last boss. Moving on to Jaina, the last boss of the raid. And I'll break down this boss phase by phase because all of the phases are quite different. The amount of RNG on this fight basically encapsulates the essence of BFA. Phase 1 was initially pretty cool to prog because there are about 3 or 4 timer variations you could get on specific mechanic things. So you had to learn on how to deal with all of them. And once you were able to deal with all of the different combinations, you were making phase 2 progress and you were always making it into phase 2. But one of the most annoying parts of this phase was your ballistas randomly catching on fire when there was no one near them. In our kill video, we had all three ballistas on one side catch on fire without anyone being near them uh, to bait the fire onto them. Having a limit on how far the fire can spawn from players um, would be a great change to this phase. Because we did notice that the fire does get baited onto players but you can't really control some of the patches. Some of the patches will just randomly spawn on the ship. And having all three randomly spawn under the ballistas was very annoying. So adding maybe a 10 or 15 yard limit to how close or how far from a player a patch can spawn would remove some of the RNG of this fight as far as the phase one goes. However, once you have the gear for it, um, it doesn't really matter. This phase, you just have to make it through with just using no reses or one res at most. Intermission 1 was pretty cool, but again, my only issue with it was the RNG. It was not super impactful, but getting a 3-2 image split where you get 3 on one side, 2 on the other, versus an all one side split where you have all the images, then the boss, the damage difference on the raid was absolutely massive and you were able to get out maybe at 8 or 9 stacks um, at most if you got a 3-2 split, whereas if you got a 5-1 split, um, or just you know an all one side split, then as soon as you got, of, got out of the phase, you had to break the barrel because your stacks were already ramped so high. 
Also for this phase, I think it was pretty cool that you needed a either a hunter or a boomkin to track the boss and call out how your race should be splitting. Another thing with this phase is that everyone was forced to play on graphics setting 1 um, just because the orbs were so poorly visible and they moved so fast um, that if you were not given enough warning, you could get frozen very, very easily. So playing the entire fight on graphics setting 1 just because of one intermission phase was pretty annoying, but what you gonna do? Moving on to phase 2, I think of the entire fight, this was by far the best phase. Um, it was very methodical, and as long as you execute it correctly, you can get through this phase every single time. The only RNG here is the Icefall spawns. If you get very unlucky, uh, maybe getting two over the barrel or getting one over the wall as you're trying to end the, this phase was a little bit annoying. But other than that, I think this phase was pretty cool as far as how it was designed, how you had to do the whole raid movement with lock gates and um, being able to kind of bait all the beams. I think this phase was very interesting. The second intermission felt like a joke compared to intermission one. My guild spent a lot of pulls progressing intermission one and perfecting it, min-maxing it. And then you get to intermission 2 and it's pretty much just a snooze fest. The first time you get to it, you get through it. Um, and then from there, every time you get to it, you will just optimize a little better. You know, put a little more range damage into the boss, a little less into the wall, until you find that perfect balance of being able to kill the wall while getting the most damage on the boss. And then the only nuance to this phase was pretty much killing the ice block um, in a fairly lenient amount of time to where you actually drop your stacks to go into the last phase with no stacks and also having a hunter kick the boss then getting grip back into the raid so he doesn't get frozen. Also for this phase most guilds went troll for the voodoo shuffle passive uh, which allowed you to get a stack reset in this phase but actually they ended up hot fixing this the week that we killed it so the voodoo shuffle was no longer um, applied to the Jaina dot or rather they just reduced its duration by 20%. That was kind of unlucky. But that was a necessary nerf, I think, for most mid-level mythic guilds, because unless you're, you're in the top um, of your region, you're not going to be spending the amount of gold to just get everyone to be um, to reroll to a different race for a single passive. Um, so overall it's a good change, it was just kind of unlucky that we happened to all change to troll and this getting hotfixed anyway. P3 was probably the most frustrating of all the phases uh, because of how much RNG there was involved. And if you got good RNG, it could mean a kill, if you got bad RNG, it could mean a wipe. So first of all, you needed to go through the first, you know, two phases and two intermissions with only using one battle res at most, that is assuming that you're running resto shamans. Then whenever you baited the glacial ray in the last phase, if it's swept towards the boss, your melee will lose a significant amount of uptime. If it's swept away from the boss, obviously your melee can keep hitting it. So there you instantly get about a 5 to 10 second uh, damage differential on your melee DPS depending on which way the beam sweeps. From there, you could get bad Icefall RNG. If you got bad Icefall RNG, meaning that you got an Icefall that went over the boss, uh, which happens to happen right after, right after the Glacial Ray, then your melee would lose another about 15 seconds of uptime. So if you got a bad Ray Sweep and you got a bad Icefall, your melee just lo lost about 20 seconds, maybe 25 seconds of uptime, in a phase that lasts 90 seconds. So that means you're not going to make the damage check. The other thing is the Siege Breaker Blast. Um, on progress, most people are sacrificing the person who gets it. On our kill, we got lucky and went on a DPS. He ran out, he died. We still made the damage check. If it goes on a healer and they're not able to survive or you don't have a battle res, you're most likely going to wipe because the healing is so intensive in the last 30 seconds of the fight that being down a healer essentially guarantees a wipe. So what are my overall thoughts on this raid? Um, I think the difficulty curve was pretty much a joke. 
because the tuning of the first five bosses was very much off. And then going from bosses that require maybe 15 pulls at most, um, you know, varying from zero pull or one pull to, to 15 for the five bosses, to around maybe 30 to 50 for the last two, and to over 300 for the last boss seemed a little bit steep. Now, as far as melee goes, Blizzard is still trying to send the message that if you're a top end raider, you better be playing a ranged class. Uldir was very similar, but I could see why they did it. Because in Uldir, you again only brought maybe four or five at most melee to most bosses, but melee did really good damage. This raid, you were limited on how many melee you can bring, and melee didn't do damage like they did in Uldir. Because the tier was dominated by Warlock, Shadow Priest, and you know the rest of the range classes, they were at least on par with melee, on perfect uptime, if not better. So basically, the only melee worth bringing to this raid seemed like one Demon Hunter, and even that was just to buff your ranged DPS's damage, and then some rogues, because they, apparently they moved away from the design philosophy that some mechanics should go through immunity, and rogues you know, just got to cloak everything in this raid again. So overall, I think this raid had a lot of potential, uh, but missed out on a lot of design and tuning, uh, which I'm kind of surprised by because there was quite a bit of testing done for this raid. Anyway, guys, that was my opinion on Battle of the Zara Lore. And if you have any of your own, please leave it in the comment section. I'm curious to see what you guys thought of the raid. Thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and sub to the channel. And I'll see you on the next one.